Okay. Um, good evening. So, in today's recitation, I'll be handling uh, how interrupts are handled in the OS 161 code. Uh, we'll go through how OS 161 begins as well, the entire early boot process, and then we'll take a look at what needs to be done for assignment one, and probably I'll give you some hints and walk you through what needs to be done as well. So, where does how, where and how does OS 161 start? It all starts at uh, the LD script, the loading, the loader script basically tells the loader that the starting point for the kernel is actually this function called start, and this can be found in the this can be found in the start.s file. So I'll, I'll show you how it looks. So this is the entry point. This is where it's set up to start at the function called underscore underscore start, and this file is there below, which is kern arc mips conf load script. And where this links is basically here. So, one moment. Ah, don't bother. So, you, as you can see here, the start function is declared here. It's pure assembly. Uh, but, and there's enough comments telling you what, about what is happening in every line. Uh, so, the point of interest here is basically where all the exception handling, the interrupt servicing routines are loaded. And, the, the routines in the OS 161 code is called uh, the MIPS general handler, and I'll just jump to it. So this is loaded once the stack is set up for the kernel. So in class today, you, must, you would have learned that there is a separate stack that is set up for the kernel, and once that is done, the memory is aligned in this format, and once that is done as well, the exception handling routines are loaded, and that happens in this in this instruction. So if we want to look at what the MIPS general handler basically is, then we need to look at another file. And this file is located at uh, exception MIPS1.s. Uh, the slides have the path to all these files. Uh, so we looked at the start.s, and now we're going into the exception MIPS1.s. And if we take a close look at the MIPS general handler code, you see that it's basically one line which says jump to common exception. That's all it is. And common exception is defined right below. So in common exception, what happens is, so as you would have learned, when an exception is, uh, when an interrupt uh, line fires on the CPU, uh, there needs to be some state that, that needs to be saved so that the kernel knows what the inter why the interrupt was triggered and what it needs to do, like how it has to handle it. So there is there is a lot of assembly here, but basically what it does is it stores a lot of state. It stores a lot of state, which is basically every single register that's on the MIPS processor. And once that is done, it jumps to this function called MIPS trap, which you can see here. So, and this is where it gets good, because MIPS trap is C code. So this is something that we can finally understand without too much difficulty. But so let's just take a quick look at MIPS trap. So if you see MIPS trap, it seems to have this structure called the trap frame. Now, the trap frame is a very neat uh, structure. It's, it's basically designed to store every single register. So it has an unsigned int uh, variable for every register that's on the CPU. So this is, this is a kind of neat mapping. So this is a software structure that maps on to what is actually present in hardware. And for whatever reason, if you guys wanted to add a new register, you would have to update this as well, so that the, the mapping is maintained. That's not something that you will have to do, though, so it's fine. And this also plays a very important role during context switches, because if you remember how context switches work, when a context switch is to happen, the current thread that is executing, all of its state needs to be saved, and then the, the state of the new thread needs to be loaded in. So the trap frame is used for that purpose as well. So all the registers of the current thread is saved into the trap frame, and then a switch happens. The new thread's frame is loaded onto the register, and then it, the CPU doesn't know that this context switch happened. It just sees that the program counter is pointing somewhere else, and it just continues executing from there. It's kind of blind to this whole process. Um, so in the MIPS trap, we will see that there seems to be this uh, variable code. This code is actually retrieved from the trap frame, and this code tells 
the kernel what type of exception occurred. So you, the MIPSTRAP function is pretty big, but basically what it is is like, if code is IRQ, then do this. If code is syscall, then do something else. And there's just like four or five cases here. Uh, pay attention to this function here because we will come back to it. It's not critical, but it's a, it's a, I have an example for which this will be used. So this happens if it's, if it's of type IRQ. So just keep a note of that. So you'll see a little below that system calls are handled in the same way. So if it is a system call, then there is, it just saves these registers and passes them on, right? And so this is the MIPS trap. Uh, so the example that I was talk, going to talk to you about is the hard clock. Now the hard clock is basically a hardware uh, timer that is in the Sys161 simulator that fires every second. And so this is a nice example because you will see how the hard clock it triggers this timer interrupt which is handled by the kernel. So what happens? First, the, ha the hardware clock is defined as part of uh, Sys161, so we need to search for ah. Okay. Okay. So the L timer IRQ is the one that's called if a ha if the hard clock fires, and the way this is called is this is one of the timers that are available. Now you can have multiple timers as well on the Sys161 board. In which case there is another path of execution, but you see that. So if we go back to the main bus that I was talking to you about, um, yeah. So if I search for where this main bus is basically defined, I think it's defined here. Yeah. So the main bus interrupt basically is another switch case because this is hardware interrupts. So there's this small switch case. And you'll see that one of the cases is basically there is this timer bit that is set. And if the timer bit is set, it knows that it's, it's being triggered by this hardware timer. And what it does is it calls hard clock. Now, what is hard clock? What does it do? Uh, hard clock is basically in place so that uh, scheduling can happen periodically, because if scheduling did not happen, then you're stuck executing just one process throughout. So you need the scheduler to occur ever so often so that the user gets this notion of concurrency. Although there is only a single core, he still thinks that there are several processes ex executing simultaneously. So, so the hard clock function basically says increment that variable there, and if it is modulo, I mean, if the, the reminder is zero when you divide by schedule hard clocks, then call schedule. If it is zero when you uh, divide by migrate hard clocks, I'll, I'll explain what these two are, then call this other function called thread consider migration. So you don't have to worry about this uh, function too much right now, because this comes into play when you have multiple CPUs, because the thread needs to be migrated from one CPU to the other. Uh, but And currently, the schedule function is kind of empty, doesn't really do anything. Uh, you will have to implement it as part of assignment two. It's, I think it's optional. Uh, so what are schedule hard clocks and migrate hard clocks? They're, they're basically macros defined on top. So basically what it says is do the sh call the scheduler every four times that hard clock fires. And the second one says migrate every 16 periods. So this is kind of how the whole interrupt part of uh, OS 161 and Sys 161 is set up. Um, so moving on from here, we go and see what is to be done in assignment one. Now, uh, if you guys have any questions regarding the code reading stuff, feel free to ask, uh, because this is a help session as well as like a recitation, so you can do anything you want. Uh, as for the coding exercises, uh, we'll have to be implementing locks. We'll have to implement condition variables and read or write locks as well as solve two classic synchronization problems that are also there. So um, I'm not going to talk too much about why we need these uh, synchronization primitives, as they are called, because they are yet to be handled in class in, in a full-blown manner. 
but I can give you some examples as to why you do that. So a simple example would be that assume you you're doing this uh, bank transaction and you have uh, on the server, which is the bank server, but you make three transactions, and because due to whatever delays, they get kind of uh, put behind, and at one point they're all trying to execute the same. So imagine your bank balance is X, and you deposit like. Hundred dollars in each of those transactions because for whatever reason that's the limit. Uh, what might end up happening is that the threads execute concurrently, and what since you're depositing, the logic is supposed to be that what is the old value plus new value, right? I mean, the old value plus the deposited value equals the new value. But what might end up happening is that the old value that was read was not reflected by one of the threads that finished its transaction. So what what I mean is. Assume one of the threads did deposit 100 and it finished, so the the new value should be x plus 100. But when the other thread tries and reads, it may pick up x, in which case you actually deposited 300 dollars, but your final account balance may be anywhere between x plus 100 and x plus 300. It's just it's indeterminate. So to solve such problems, you use the synchronization primitives just to ensure that only one. Uh, when you have a shared resource, only one thread is has access to it at any given point in time. Uh, so uh, locks, condition variables are just uh, different primitive space. Work very similar to each other, but there are some subtle differences. But they all give you the same uh, ability. Yes. Okay. No, uh, semaphore, so mutex is a special form of semaphore. It's not different from a semaphore. Mutex just means that, so semaphores are used to lock resources. So let's say you have 10, uh, quant a quantity of 10 for a particular resource, right? And you're kind of giving out this resource to whoever wants it. Now you can think, let's say you have like 10 cores on your system. You generally don't block cores, or you don't put a semaphore around cores. Imagine you had like 10 MB of RAM or whatever you want, some quantity which is 10. So when different threads request for this resource, uh, semaphore is used to kind of uh, ensure that two threads don't get the same resource instance. So what it does is when one thread requests, it kind of blocks, gives away one, and unblocks. So th when the other thread, yes, just hold on, let me finish this. So when another thread requests, it checks whether it has any resource remaining, and then hands that out, right? Mutex is a special case where it's 0, 1. Yeah. I have only one instance Binary. of the resource. So, I mean, these are, uh, that is also a primitive. No, it's not hardware. OK, so I probably should have put semaphore as well here. But basically, what this slide says is what you need to implement. Semaphore is already given to you implemented. So semaphore is fully implemented. You can use semaphores right from the get-go. You had a question? So what you're talking about is in, uh, no. The short answer is no. You don't necessarily. Uh, associate resource with core, you could, but it doesn't. There is no uh, implicit association. You could explicitly associate, but it's not by default already implicit. Right? If you lock, it's just locked to that core. At least not in modern systems. I'm not entirely sure how it works in OS 161. I'll have to check. Mm -hmm. Not, yes, uh, there is synchronization issues even with single core because you may have two processes trying to access common state. So it's possible even in single core. With multi core, it just gets worse. So 
what I've stated is basically some of the functionalities that you have to implement. So you'll see that there is a common create destroy for all of them. Uh, locks have this notion of acquiring and releasing, whereas for CVs it's just basically different nomenclature. It's called wait and signal. Uh, and for reader write locks it's the same, except that there are two operations. You can acquire read, acquire write, and the same, release read and release write. Uh, so for the special functions of each of them, locks have this uh, special API or interface, which is do I hold. So locks are something that is held, locks are something that are held by a single thread. And so other threads should not be allowed to modify the lock. Like for example, I have said lock this resource, and the system has given me that lock. Another thread should not say, you know what, since he's holding, I want to release it. I want the resource. He should not be able to release that, right? So you have this notion of do I hold. It's just, just like a Boolean function that says either true or false. Uh, for condition variables, you have this special function called broadcast. So the way all of these work is that when I lock a resource and someone else wants that same resource, they go to sleep. They wait until I release. And when I release, I basically wake them up. So what happens is that these processes that are waiting go to this thing called the wait channel or a wait queue. And they just sleep there. They're not in the run queue, so the processor will not execute them. So they just sit in this separate channel, right? So when I release that resource, I, I basically wake whoever is up on that wait queue. So there is an implicit uh, wait queue associated with a lock. And people who are waiting for that same resource go to that wait channel, right? I'm sorry, I'm using wait channel and wait queue interchangeably. They mean the same, so don't get confused with that. Now, why I spoke about the wait channel is because condition variables give you this ability to broadcast. So what happens is it basically says wake up everybody on the wait channel. Whoever runs next gets it. So it gives you some, some notion of randomness there because it's not first in, first out necessarily. It could be, but it's not deterministic basically. Um, reader writer locks will require, I think you can use semaphores to solve reader writer locks, but I strongly recommend against it. Uh, you could use locks or condition variables to do it. It should be far more simple and easier to follow for your teammates as well. Um, I'll probably handle them in more detail in the next week's uh, recitation. Um, but once you have these primitives set up, you need to solve these classic synchronization problems. Now, I'll go on to the website for this. The first problem is the whale mating problem. And the whale mating problem basically says that y for a successful pair uh, to happen, you need a male whale, you need a female whale, and you need a matchmaker. Once you have all of these three, a pair happens. Uh, what this means in terms of code is that three threads, threads are started up. Threads can be either male, female, or a matchmaker thread. But the moment the system has one of each, it should pair up, and all three should just terminate. Right? They should leave the system. So what the, the code checker does is it knows how many threads it started up. It will always start like pairwise. Right? So there will always be n pairs at the end of it. So it starts up threads randomly, and it checks whether all those threads terminate eventually. If they didn't terminate, then there's something wrong with your code, because uh, the system knows that it, it started n pairs, and n pairs did not end up terminating. So that's what that test does. Uh, the whale mating problem is pretty simple, but you need to be careful about the order in which you acquire and release locks, or condition variables, or whatever. The order, and, the order in which you acquire and release whatever synchronization primitive that you're using to solve this problem. Because the order ends up mattering a lot. You may end up in a situation where the male is waiting for a female, and the female is waiting for a male. And then you're like, who's going to wake who up? That's what is called a deadlock. So you have these two resources, and a thread, a thread acquires resource A, a thread acquires resource B. The first thread is waiting on B, the second thread is waiting on A. And now you're stuck. So you need to be careful about that while solving the whale mating problem. And this, will, this deadlock will occur potentially a lot more in the stoplight problem, because this is slightly more complicated to solve. 
the stoplight problem is basically you have this four-way intersection. Uh, cars can come in through any direction. And you need to ensure that when a car is either going straight or taking a left or taking a right, uh, no other car is on that same quadrant. Because if they are, then it means there's a crash. Uh, so there are three basic operations here. So uh, just to give you some insight, let's say we are traveling through the intersection from quadrant two, right, or coming in this path. So if we were taking a right, we need access to only quadrant two. We don't need access to any other. If we were going straight, we need access to two and one. If we were taking a left, we need two, one, and zero. Similarly for the other directions as well. But the point to note here is that right turns are kind of like, it doesn't really matter because only one quadrant is in play. It does in the large scale because car zero might be trying to take a left, in which case it'll have to go zero, three, and two. So two does matter in that case, but right turns are generally easier to handle than straight or left. Left is probably the most difficult, and you will have to keep in mind the locking order as well here. The locking order matters a lot. And generally, if you end up having a deadlock, unless your lock implementation or the synchronization primitive that you're using, unless you implemented that wrongly, the problem is possibly, potentially, the locking order. So you need to be careful about these. And I think that is all we have in assignment two. Uh, sorry, assignment one. OK. so. I can walk you through some of the code that is there. Um, so most of the stuff that you will be writing is very similar to how semaphores are already implemented on the system. So I'll just walk you through some of that. OK. So this is basically how the semaphore is declared, or defined, sorry. So there is a structure called semaphore. It has a name, mostly only for debugging purposes. It has the weight channel associated with it. It has a spin lock. A spin lock is like a primitive uh, lock that I think depends on hardware. So just use the API provided, but don't bother too much about how the spin lock works. You can go through the code. The code is available. And it has a sem count. Now, the sem count is the quantity of resources that I was talking about. So if you wanted a mutex semaphore, you would basically set sem count to be one. And then you, there's only one, one resource, so it either gives out or waits until it's released. And as for the operations that you perform on a semaphore, there is sem create, sem destroy, p and v. Now, the p and v are basically, uh, I think, Dutch words. Uh, but they've just been abbreviated as P and V. P is acquire, V is release, right? And the implementation is there as well. So as you can see here, the, let me walk you through each of these functions and what they do, because some of the order and the, the k freeze are important. So the create function. So it returns a semaphore pointer. So it's clear that when you want to create a new semaphore, you just uh, like assign a pointer to sem create. And what happens is, first, it asserts that the initial count is greater than or equal to 0, because it's wrong to have an initial count that's like minus 1. What does that even mean? So once that's done, uh, it tries to malloc that amount of memory. Uh, if that fails, then there is a memory issue, and it just terminates. It returns null. Uh, if that does succeed, then it, he copies the name onto the local pointer, right? And this is just to ensure that the name is not being overloaded by multiple calls in any way. So once, so keep in mind here. So if the name fails, you don't return null. You free what you allocated before, and then you return null. And you'll see that when you go onto the wait channel create as well, if it fails, then you free the name, free the semaphore, and then return null. And it's just this chain that goes on and on. So the more stuff you have, the more stuff you'll be freeing. OK, so at the end of the day, he, sets, he creates a weight channel. He initiates a spin lock. 
he sets the count and returns the sum for. It's pretty basic. And destroy does the same thing. Just freeze everything. So there are functions that destroy some of, uh, spin locks. There are functions that de destroy weight channels as well. So you see that most of these structures that are uh, internal to the kernel have their own create and destroy functions. And semaphores, locks, CVs are all to be designed in the same way. They're to provide these functions that will create them and destroy them. Now for the interesting stuff, the P and the V. So when you call P, since this is not object-oriented programming, P is not associated with a class. So you have to actually pass in the object or the variable that you're going to call P on, right? So you pass in the semaphore, and the first thing it checks is, is it null? I can't do anything if it's null. So that's the first check. And then there is this, uh, he checks whether the interrupts are turned on. You don't have to bother too much about that, but I think you, I think you should use that when you're implementing your locks and uh, CVs. And what he does after that is he acquires the, the lock, the spin lock, right? The spin lock is basically there to ensure that whatever happens after this will happen atomically. That is, no other thread can be calling this same function or executing this same piece of code on this semaphore. So the lock is per semaphore. It's not per CPU. So uh, he acquires the lock, and while the sem count is zero, that is while there is no resource to give out, he just sleeps. What does he do? He locks the weight channel. He releases the spin lock. This is, this is interesting, because this order matters. If you release the spin lock first, and then did the weight channel lock, what might end up happening is the quantity is zero. right? You release the spin lock, which means someone else called p, potentially and they ended up locking the weight channel. And when they lock the weight channel and go to sleep, uh, they're basically sleeping, right? And so when you try to lock the weight channel, you might end up causing a deadlock again because of this ordering issue. So this ordering really does matter a lot. What you're basically doing is, before you release this lock on the spin lock, you're locking some other valuable resource and then releasing it, just to ensure that everything is still atomic. And once you grab the spin lock, you go to sleep on that weight channel. I'm sorry. Once you grab the weight channel lock, you go to sleep on that weight channel. And this basically happens only after someone woke you up. So this is a blocking operation. You just stay in that single line of code until someone calls wake one, which is the wake, wake channel function that you will see in V. Right. So you're basically stuck in that single line until this executes. When this executes, you come back to life. And you are removed from that weight channel and put in the run queue, and the processor will execute you eventually. So the moment that is done, what happens is he acquires the spin lock again. Now, if I go a little above, you'll notice that you're still inside the loop, right? So this is just like precaution. So you expect that if someone woke you up, then the resource count has increased. But what might happen is someone else already grabbed that resource. Between this and this, someone already grabbed that resource and is using it. So you acquire the spin, uh, spin lock, you go back to the top, come back down, because the resource count is still zero, and it's just looping until you're sure that I have the resource. Now once that happens, uh, you decrement the sem count and you release the spin lock, because that's all needs to be atomic in this operation. And while this is complex, the release part is pretty simple. It's straightforward. You just acquire the spin lock, increment the count, wake one on the weight channel, and release the spin lock. So that's all the release function has to do. So generally, you will find that the acquire is far more complex than the re release. Any questions? Yes? It's, it's a blocking operation. So if you're unable to acquire the weight channel lock, you'll just be stuck there until it succeeds. Okay. So internally, it's another blocking operation. You're just stuck there until you're able to acquire.
So for the lock functions, there are some placeholder placeholders given for you. You should go ahead and implement stuff. It also it doesn't really tell you what needs to be done or what the semantics have to be. Uh, however, I think there is some semantic information for oh there is there is semantic information for all of them. One moment, let me get into that. So here, uh, is it readable? Hold on. So for each of the functions, what needs to be done in them is has been given in comments. Um, this is particularly important for condition variables because it, I think there is a little more detail for the CVs. Or rather, it's more straightforward for the CVs. He's basically telling you what needs to be done. So yeah, so you'll want to try and finish implementing at least one of these uh, synchronization primitives, if not all, by within two weeks or so, so that you can move on to the synchronization problems. Uh, the problems, as I mentioned, are the uh, whale mating and the stoplight ones. And they are in sync probs. Where am I? Yeah. Let me see if I can change. No, I'm not going to bother. So the sync probs folder has both the problems. Uh, there is a driver here. You are free to modify the driver, but keep in mind that the driver will be replaced. So any change that you make to the driver will not reflect in our testing code. So the driver file is completely replaced with a version that we know works, because you can just modify the driver to print what the answer should be. right? So we're obviously going to replace that. Uh, the problems.c is the one that you really want to look at, and you should be modifying. So, so uh, for the whale mating stuff, there is an init and cleanup function provided to you. So what you want to do is, if you are using semaphores or locks or whatever it is, please put the create functions in init and the destroy ones in cleanup. Because I think that this test involves multiple runs of the whale mating problem, and you might be leaking memory right? if you don't clean up correctly. So if you don't destroy your locks or whatever, then memory is just being consumed by that lock. And at one point, you might find that the, the, sim the operating system is out of memory, and it will basically crash at that point, and you will not get points. So you want, you want to make sure to destroy or clean up all the stuff that you actually use memory for. Uh, the general rule of the thumb is that anything that is calling kmalloc, there should be an equivalent k-free. So the whale mating stuff, other than the init and cleanup, have three functions, uh, male, female, and matchmaker, as I already mentioned. So basically what happens is, most of your code is supposed to go between the start and end functions. right? So what happens is that's where you will do your pairing logic. You'll wait for one female and one matchmaker, and then pair them up. And when male end is called, it means that it has succeeded. right? And if you have problems, basically what will happen is it will deadlock before the call to male end, and it will never call male end. So our testing code knows that something is wrong. Uh, it, you might also find it interesting if you really want to mess around with our test checking code. You could actually go through the driver and see what is exactly being done because this is this is the file that our I mean this is the code that our checker uses, right? So the whale mating function actually defines what is being called and how many times and what happens. So you can actually fiddle around with it to try and figure out ways in which you can manipulate our testing code and get marks for incorrect solutions if you want to. But the ethical thing to do would be to post them on Piazza if there is a problem, because at least we can fix it for future 
uh, years. Well, you may may not get the marks. It's it's up to Jeff. So again, for the stoplight, you have similar functions, uh, init and cleanup, and then there is go straight, turn left, and turn right. So very similar to what you saw before, you will have to implement your stuff just before the V call. Uh, this is using semaphores because that's the one synchronized primitive that's provided for you. So it uses semaphores to ensure that the number of calls to P equals the number of calls to V at the end of it. I think that's the way it works. Um, Again, uh, the code for how the stoplight problem is invoked is here as well. Uh, it, one point to note is that this call to this, the call to this random yielder makes it difficult to reproduce the same events. Because there is, there is some notion of randomness involved in the code, and it is difficult to actually get it to re replay the same events as they occurred in your previous uh, run. So debugging this might get a little tricky. Uh, so it's very important to actually make sure your design is correct before you start coding this stuff. That's about all I have for you. So if you have any questions for me, I'm willing to take them. Uh, there's nothing more in the slides either, so. I, that's the mistake I made. Uh, it's wrong to think of the CPU as a resource, you, but you can definitely think of a variable as a resource. Right? So if you wanted access to a variable, then it, you would use uh, something, what you mentioned as a mutex semaphore. You either have access to it or you don't. Right? You don't want to have two people write into that same variable at the same time. So you'll use something like a mutex semaphore and lock that variable, and that's now a resource that you're sharing among different threads. So the, the problem why, I, I, I don't think you can actually lock CPUs. You probably can. But what happens in that case is, what if the, the code that's running on the CPU is the same CPU that you're trying to lock? Like, I don't know what happens in that case. I have not thought about it completely. But I have to go through like Linux to find out what exactly happens in such cases. Yes, you have to write your own test for this. Uh, we do have a test. It's just that it's not being provided to you. So you can't make sure it works by running it on your own system. Now, you're free to submit like 200 different versions to the online grader, and you will get back marks for it. But it's just that the, that test code is not being given to you as source. right? So you don't exactly know what it does. So the yeah, so I think uh, the, his, uh, the assignment also says that you need to write your own test case for the reader writer logs. Um, it's generally difficult to do that, but if you guys want hints as to what is a good testing suite or what is a good uh, logic to use while testing, we'll be, I mean, we're welcome. You're welcome to come ask us, and we'll be more than happy to help you out with logic, because this is stuff that we probably have to think about as well. Like, I'm sure that uh, there is, a, we have some solutions, and if I go through that, I'm sure there'll be something that there's like this one test which is very good, but it gives us a chance to think about it as well, and I think that's that's nice. Anything else? Okay. 